That's preeclampsia. Number two is chronic hypertension, which means that a patient who has high blood pressure becomes pregnant. That means it predates the pregnancy. And one and two is three. That's pretty simple. And three is chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia, and that occurs uh, fairly often. Uh, depending on which studies you look at, it may be as much as 20 to 50 percent of the patients with chronic hypertension will develop evidence of preeclampsia. And number four is what we call gestational hypertension, which means the patient did not have high blood pressure prior to pregnancy. She developed high blood pressure, which means 140 systolic or 90 diastolic or greater after 20 weeks, but no other evidence of preeclampsia. It's very important to put the patient into the correct classification so that management decisions can follow. The management of preeclampsia is very simple. If you have severe range blood pressures, which are defined as 160 systolic or 110 diastolic, and we can talk about some alternative triggers later, you need to control that blood pressure because that's considered an acute hypertensive emergency. Number two is seizure prevention or the use of magnesium sulfate for severe preeclampsia, and we can discuss other nuances of who to treat. Number three is the definitive uh, cure for preeclampsia is delivery, 34 weeks for severe preeclampsia and 37 weeks for any other form of preeclampsia. Even though delivery is the most important therapeutic intervention to cure this disease, because the disease is a multi-system disorder, the, the postpartum period is particularly dangerous because we have always considered them to be out of the woods at that point, but the fact is that a lot of complications still occur in the postpartum period, and that's number four. So, moving on, as Julie mentioned, the American College of OBGYN Executive Summary of Hypertension in Pregnancy was published in 2013, and this was a presidential initiative under James Martin, who's a chair at Mississippi and has a lot of experience with three times here, where a group of, quote, experts got together and came up with these new guidelines. And they are now part of the standard guidelines for the management of, of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. Next. And the reason that this was uh, decided to be worked on was this slide. As you can see, if you look at this uh, CDC slide of deaths, maternal deaths, about 20% were from preeclampsia. And you can see that of the group that died of complications of preeclampsia, 90% were uh, stroke from hemorrhage. This is a very important statistic because it allows us to then tailor our treatment. Next. As you know, the maternal mortality rate in this country has been going up. We're the only developed country in the world where it's going up. Most of the other developed countries are going down. It was the subject of an article in The Economist last month. Uh, in the red is the United States rate, and as you can see, it's been going up and continues to rise. And in two, you can see that we hit a high in California around 2006-2007 when the maternal mortality review was instituted. And for reasons that are not always known, you can notice that the maternal mortality rate in California has plummeted. We think it's probably due to bringing attention to maternal morbidity and mortality. But the fact is, our maternal mortality rate has dropped. There is one glaring problem, which is the disparities in race. And as you can see in the green, we're talking about white non-Hispanics. Whereas in the top uh, of blue, dark blue, you can see the African-American non-Hispanic maternal death rate. And you can see that it is quite uh, a marked disparity with a disparity ratio uh, in red, which means that that's the so a, 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 if you look at any of these numbers, a African-American woman has somewhere in the range of three to five times the chance of dying uh, in pregnancy. Next slide. Looking at the causes of death from the Pregnancy Associated Mortality Review, you can see that in California, uh, 25, uh, seven, sorry, there were 25 deaths which made up 70% of the maternal deaths in California, and if you remember, the U.S. numbers was about 19%, so it's about the same. Uh, but with each death, even though you look at that little red dot, 
We've got eight mortalities, say, in 2007. There's many, many more near misses, which are patients who suffer severe complications, require ICU admission, the long postpartum length of stay, and those are you know, 40 to 50 fold greater than those that die. So the actual morbidity, the actual cost, both emotionally and financially, and to the family and society, is huge from this disease. Next. And we note that uh, underlying hypertension is present in uh, about half of the patients who have uh, who had died of preeclampsia. So chronic hypertension has always been a very uh, important predisposing factor to those patients who ultimately die of preeclampsia. So again, as I pointed out at the beginning, chronic hypertension is a very important risk factor for people who develop preeclampsia. Next. And, and have a lot of morbidity. If you look at this, again, from the maternal mortality review, and this is a three-year review, if you look at the, uh, the colored line of preeclampsia, eclampsia, what, this, what our committee has did is we reviewed every case of maternal death, and out of that case, we dissected down and decided whether or not had that patient been managed according to a well-known, well-evidence-based standard of care, would she have died or could the death have been prevented? And as you can see, out of 35 deaths, 21 of them, the committee felt had a strong to good chance of not dying had uh, standard measures been implemented. And most of this had to do with blood pressure control. That's about 60% of the patients had a strong to good chance of surviving. And then another 40, the rest of the 40%, there were some uh, things that were not done that could have been done that may have made a difference. So that's a really important statistic that we as healthcare providers can prevent many of the deaths from this disease. The diagnostic criteria for preeclampsia are clear. It's blood pressure of 140 systolic or greater or 90 diastolic or greater at these two occasions, four hours apart after 20 weeks of gestation of a patient with a previously normal pressure. The arrow points out one of the problems with that definition, which is when patients come in with acute severe hypertension of 160 systolic or 110 diastolic or greater, that's considered an acute hypertensive emergency. And those patients need to have their blood pressure repeated in the correct way, which Nancy will talk about in a minute. And if the repeat blood pressures remain in those acute ranges, the patient needs to be treated. So the mantra is repeat and treat. And that short interval of repeat is you can do it, you can say whatever you want, but we consider that to be about a 15 minute interval. And so you do not need to wait for four hours. If you have acute range pressures, repeat, and it's still acute range pressures, they must be treated because that's the group of patients that actually had a high risk of dying of a cerebrovascular accident. Proteinuria is traditionally 300 milligrams in 24 hour collection, but because it's so difficult to collect it, we now accept a protein creatinine ratio of greater than 0.3. And if you can do neither the 24 hour urine or protein creatinine ratio, then you can go to the weakest form of documenting proteinuria of one plus as a dipstick, but it still is useful. However, there are patients, maybe as many as 10% of patients, who do not have proteinuria yet, but if they have any of these other findings, which are evidence of end organ involvement, thrombocytopenia, renal insufficiency, paired liver function, pulmonary edema, cerebral vision symptoms, they automatically carry the diagnosis of preeclampsia at that point. So if you have a patient with hypertension, no proteinuria, and none of these uh, end organ findings after 20 weeks, you can call her gestational hypertension. But you can't say she doesn't have preeclampsia if she doesn't have proteinuria, but she's got one of these end organ involved. So it is important to recognize that proteinuria occurs in most, but not all patients with preeclampsia. Next. And we know that if a patient presents with new onset, and this is a very important word, new onset. New onset means she never had it before. She never had it before pregnancy. It's new onset after 20 weeks. Either new onset hypertension or new onset proteinuria, 
40% of them will go on and develop classic peak transit. So the patient who walks in with new onset proteinuria, normal blood pressure, and you all say, oh, it's a urinary tract infection, and you do a urine culture, and then you send her home and don't follow up on her, 40% of those patients are going to develop preeclampsia. So it is important for us to have a high index of suspicion, anybody who develops either new onset hypertension or proteinuria. And then, of course, these vague symptoms, which we know yeah. every single pregnant patient has, headache, abdominal pain, shortness of breath, generalized swelling, complaints I don't feel right. Many, many pregnant women will have one or more of these complaints. But if a patient comes in with persistent complaints of particularly these five, which have been looked at and studied by the Preclampsia Foundation, it is important for us to be sure that we rule out preeclampsia because the Preclampsia Foundation, which is a lay, a group of lay women who have experienced severe preeclampsia, eclampsia, fetal death, um, ICU stays, and unfortunately some of their relatives, because the patients themselves have died, have said over and over again that we do not listen to our patients, that they keep complaining of the same things, and we keep ignoring them. So, a simple way of ruling out preeclampsia if a patient has persistent complaints is to bring them in and do some simple laboratory studies. There's only four things you need to do. A CBC with platelet count, liver enzymes, a test of some of a renal function. You can do a bilirubin movement if you want. Some people do a uric acid as an index of severe preeclampsia, although that's not accepted in the United States, but it is accepted in Canada. And if the patient has acute abdominal pain and you're concerned about something else like pancreatitis or acute fatty liver, you should do amylase, lipase, and ammonia. All of this can be done simply, a little bit of observation, serial blood pressures, and you can rule out preeclampsia in most of your patients. Next. Severe preeclampsia is a separate category, and it is based on either blood pressure criteria, which is 160 or 110 or greater, and this time it's four hours apart, although you're not going to wait for the four hours because if they hit that level, you're going to treat them. And if you've treated them, they now have severe preeclampsia. But if they come in at 160 over 110, you repeat it and they down at 150 over 90. And four hours later, they had 160 over 110 again. Now you've got severe preeclampsia. Or they have any of these other evidence of end organ with involvement, which we've already spoken about. They have severe preeclampsia and they need to be treated differently to the patient with non-severe preeclampsia. Next. Just to emphasize once again, the treatment of acute hypertension, it's considered a hypertensive emergency. This comes from the ACOG bulletin. So acute onset persistence, 50 minutes or more, 160, 110. Uh, it's a hypertensive emergency, and you do not wait four hours. If it's still elevated after 15 minutes, you need to treat within as soon as possible, but we say within 30 to 60 minutes, ACOG criteria are 60 minutes, but we uh, try to uh, emphasize the fact that the quicker the better. Next. And this was a recent update of that committee opinion, where, um, as you know, the primary drugs that we are recommending are intravenous lovedolol, intravenous hydralazine, and you could use either one as first-line therapy. But because of difficulties with an IV at times and a difficulty in administering the IV medication, evidence has now come forward that suggests that oral nifedipine would be considered a first-line therapy, and this is now official ACOG bulletin of 2015 from February of this year. And it actually is a very useful alternative. Because if you do not manage these patients well, you're going to end up with what we call the deadly triad, which is severe preeclampsia, another subset which is HELP syndrome, or the worst uh, complication, which is, of course, is seizures and eclampsia. And, of course, all of these terrible outcomes, which is both fetal and maternal, which can include fetal death, maternal death, both, or really severe morbidity. Next. And the term mild preeclampsia has been discouraged by ACOG because of the connotation that this disease has got is mild in any form. There is no such thing as a mild form of preeclampsia. There's either severe preeclampsia or that without severe features. Now, you can nuance this any which way you wish, 
But the intent of ACOG was to try and take away this perception that this is a benign, potentially benign disease. Just to remind you again, 20% of the deaths in the U.S. were from preeclampsia, and 90% of them were from hemorrhage, hemorrhagic stroke. And if you look at our California, California data, 64% of our deaths were from stroke, and 80, 90% of them were hemorrhagic. So we don't have to repeat, you know, reinvent the wheel. We know what causes deaths in preeclampsia. It's hemorrhagic stroke probably from uncontrolled hypertension. And the British have shown us this in a very clear way. On the right-hand side of your slide is the UK data. And as you know, the United Kingdom's got a very well-developed system of, of maternal mortality review. They review every single case in the British Isles. And you can see that their incidence of stroke is half of ours, so that their overall death rate from stroke is ours is twice that of the, of the British uh, system. And the British pointed out next, very clearly that it was from um, hypertension and put in aggressive um, management protocols to control hypertension, and the results are pretty clear. So we believe that we have got pretty good data that you need to control the blood pressure if you're going to avoid stroke. One other small thing about gestational age. A little bit of an awkward slide, if you look at the left-hand side, you can see that the patients under 37 weeks, the 56% of patients who died of preeclampsia were premature officially. Actually, many of them were less than 34 weeks. Uh, but if you look at the right-hand side, the non-preeclampsia deaths, only 37% of them were premature. So that's another good clinical little nuance, little nugget for you, is that if somebody presents before 37 weeks, but particularly before 34 weeks, with evidence of new onset hypertension, new onset proteinuria uh, symptoms, that patient is likely to have severe preeclampsia and have a particularly dangerous course. Next slide. And the severe preterm preeclampsia well, can often rapidly progress to significant morbidity and mortality. And so they should be managed by, pay, by a, uh, an obstetrician and an obstetrical team, and this is not to um, belittle either the family practitioners or the nurse midwives who take care of these patients, but this is a particularly dangerous disease, and so the recommendation from both ACOG and others is that those patients be managed at a tertiary center uh, and not be managed at a community hospital where you may not have the facilities to take care of a sick mom. You may have a level three or two, level community two nursery and be able to take care of a 28 week baby, but taking care of a sick woman, pregnant woman in a place that doesn't do it very often is, is, is very difficult because the ICU staff are not used to these types of patients. And so it is recommended that these patients be transferred to facilities with adequate maternal neonatal intensive care. So the patient presents at 34 weeks or less with severe preeclampsia. They need to be stabilized, which means you need to start them on mag to seizure prophylaxis. You need to give them blood pressure control using whichever combination of medications works for your facility. Make sure they're not in pulmonary edema and that they're otherwise stable. And then, uh, transfer them out, and so that we can take care of them in a center which is used to taking care of these extremely sick patients. Next. And so after the initial 24 to 40 hour observation and steroids on board, if we con control their blood pressure and they are not developing HELP syndrome or decreasing renal function, those patients are observed on the right-hand side with expectant management until 34 weeks. So anytime between 24 and 34 weeks, if we control their blood pressure and they're not getting worse, we are on the right hand side of this algorithm. We expect the management until 34 weeks, but as an inpatient, not as an outpatient. On the left hand side, you can control their blood pressure or they, the disease progresses in front of your eyes, you may need to deliver them. Sometimes before Steroids are complete, but in our experience, that is very rare. You can usually get 48 hours, 
And steroids tend to mitigate the features of severe preeclampsia. It's just temporary, but oftentimes the fake counts will rise, the liver enzymes will go down under the influence of steroids, and then 48 hours later, as the steroids wear off, they get sicker. That's all. So if you look at the expectant management before 34 weeks, it's fairly simple. Uh, on the left-hand side are the criteria. On the right-hand side is all the things that say no. And they all know you can't delay delivery unless the last one you can control their blood pressure. So if a patient comes in with any or all of the left-hand side criteria, you cannot really delay delivery for very long. You may get the 48 hours, but uh, if they start developing renal failure, parasitic injury, from edema, you have to deliver them in, to save a mom's life. The most common thing we do is control the blood pressure. And once the blood pressure is controlled, they often will go on for more than 48 hours, and we deliver them at 34 weeks. But they have to be very closely monitored. And they do not have severe preeclampsia. ACOG's recommendation, which has become very controversial, is that they be delivered at 37 weeks irrespective. And that's based on the hypertech study out of uh, two studies out of uh, the Netherlands, where they showed that if you don't deliver even a quote mild preeclampsia at 37 weeks, that 40% of them are going to go on and have severe hypertension with all the potential sequelae of that. Uh, severe hypertensive crisis. And so the recommendation is even for the milder form of the disease, the little by 37 weeks. I'm now going to turn this over to Nancy Peterson. Thank you, Dr. Drusen. Um, thanks all for joining us this afternoon. And I'm going to start with talking about some of the factors that contribute to, to our um, pregnancy related deaths, um, specifically about preeclampsia. And if you look down at the healthcare professional, more than 96% of the um, contributing factors were related to um, delay in diagnosis and use of ineffective treatment, as well as misdiagnosis. So um, again, this is a huge issue that we recognize that we needed to um, address in the toolkit. So from our um, data that we obtained from reviewing these cases, we came up with some quality improvement um, strategies and the main ones that we really uh, identified and addressed in the toolkit was that many of these cases had very clear triggers that indicated that the patient was deteriorating and the healthcare providers failed to recognize and respond in a timely manner, which led to, you know, again, delays in, in diagnosis and treatment. There were at least 60% of the cases had missed vital sign triggers. So as we reviewed the cases, they were very clearly stated in the documentation that they were missed or um, didn't take them seriously. There were other triggers such as proteinuria, headaches, epigastric pain, deteriorated fetal status, and altered mental status that were also not recognized as serious. And actually, the, the altered mental status was kind of a theme that we saw through many of these um, charts that we reviewed where both family members um, came and told the healthcare providers that their, you know, their loved one wasn't really acting in their normal way and they were confused and it was really kind of overlooked and not really taken seriously. So a key critical pearl from this is to have an organized tool to help identify those clinical signs that were, um, you know, or missed triggers that can aid the clinicians to recognize and respond in a more timely manner to avoid those delays in treatment and diagnosis. And as well, the Joint Commission in 2010 came out in their Sentinel Alert about that all birthing facilities should have a process in place for both recognition and appropriate response in the event that the patient uh, starts to deteriorate and have something in written criteria describing early warning signs and, and what your intervention strategies are. In addition, to have protocols and drills in place for helping staff recognize and, and respond and treat preeclampsia as a team. So this is our um, preeclampsia early recognition tool that we put together. And the hope was really that um, we could incorporate this into our um, or charting EPIC or whatever system that you have um, to help you identify as a patient is progressing from 
early signs of preeclampsia to a more severe form. Um, so essentially, it was color coded like a stoplight um, in that all the normal columns, you know, you, you basically continued with your normal protocol. Any trigger in the yellow column, or two triggers, and I'll go to the next page in a second here, would indicate that you need to do something and do more, more evaluation, get somebody to come in and do a bedside evaluation, order some labs, and, and really assess the direction that she's heading. And then severe, of course, is uh, you need to get somebody in, on board. So the second part of this that you um, is, is really following so that if you have one or more triggers in the yellow column, you need to um, give you some guidelines as far as what you need to do. And the red column, again, depending on where that trigger is, it gives you some other guidelines to start doing further study to try and identify while you're getting, hopefully, these patients, you know, consults and potentially getting them transported to a higher level of care. As many of you have seen, this is uh, the ACOG bulletin that came out in October of 2014. Um, that talked about another internal early warning um, criteria proposal from the National Partnership for Internal Safety. And this is kind of a very uh, simple, more simplistic model, but it, it really um, identifies the major areas that you need to focus on as far as looking at um, early warning signs that could potentially, again, help you recognize uh, the progression of the disease. So this is another great tool to implement. Um, it's a little bit more simple. So I'm going to go through some of the toolkit treatment recommendations um, and starting with blood pressure basics. Because this is, um, you know, many of you wonder why we're even talking about basic blood pressure because we all learned this in our first couple weeks of training. But it is one of the most important basic clinical assessments that we do and yet it is really inaccurately performed in a vast majority of cases that lead to delay and in both diagnosis and treatment. So it's really an important piece that we need to pay better attention to and educate our staff on how to accurately take a blood pressure. And this is just a case in point that we um, identified in our, our reviews. And it was very typical. We saw numerous cases like this. And that this is a 31-year-old primus that came in at 36 plus four weeks to station. Four seventh with gestation speaking. Presented to labor and delivery with hypertension, blood pressures ranging from 140s over 90s to 150s over 80s. They started an induction, and when her blood pressure in a sideline position was normal, they discontinued the induction and sent her home. Three days later, she returned at 37 weeks and for a follow up, and her blood pressure was again 137 over 89 in semi fowler's position, and then when they turned her laterally, it was 121 over 76. She was having a trace of protein at that time, but they went ahead and sent her home and put her on bed rest. So for whatever reason, the patient did not return to the hospital until 42 weeks um, for cervical ripening uh, with a history of preeclampsia, which was her documented rate of induction. Um, she ended up having a C-section at 8 centimeters for failure to the breast. Her vital signs were documented as stable um, during that initial recovery period at 111 over 65 to 150 over 90. And then at 11 hours post-op, it was 152 over 99. And on post-op day two, she started to complain of severe headache with blood pressures ranging from 170s over 80 to 240 over 120. And at this point, she still had not received any antihypertensive medication. She ended up coding within minutes and was transferred to a higher level of care, secondary to acute coma with a subdermal hematoma and a midline shift. And she ended up dying uh, 18 hours after transport on postpartum day three. So again, this is not a really unusual case that we saw. We saw this over and over and over again with these patients that came in with severe range blood pressures and did not get any medication until it was too late. Um, so I want to walk you through, this is um, right out of our toolkit, um, steps for uh, obtaining an accurate blood pressure. And we're going to kind of go step by step um, and talk about some of these issues. So the first thing is you need to make sure you have the right equipment. And as you know, there's two main methods, oscillatory or manual or a solometric, which is the automated devices that most hospitals use today. Now, mercury signal manometers are the gold standard, but they are pretty much extinct. Most places don't have them anymore, and it was 
you know, due to the uh, worry about toxic effects of mercury if they broke. Um, so you really can't find them very often unless you go to eBay, which I've seen on there. They're actually pretty expensive, or in a museum. Um, so most of them are replaced by the aneroid or the clock face type um, manual cuff that you see most often now in doctor's offices. But the thing that people need to understand is that those need to be calibrated with, with a mercury signal manometer every six months in order to validate their accuracy. Um, and automated devices as well. The American Heart Association recommends that these devices be validated also with a mercury signal manometer with every patient. And so what that means and what we've recommended is that if you are using an automated device, for the vast majority of patients, it's perfectly acceptable and it works well. However, in patients with acute hypertension, these monitors are really not the best way to get an accurate blood pressure. Um, but if that's all you have, what we recommend, at least you have a cuff around on the unit um, with all the different size cuffs or with a mercury sigma manometer so that you can first take it with the auto cuff or auto device and then retake it with a mercury uh, cuff and compare them. Um, and if, this is a typical um, blood pressure machine, um, and this is actually um, a variant that's clinically acceptable by the International Standards Organization that is used by the manufacturers of these um, blood pressure devices to test against mercury. Um, and the standard calls for a difference of plus or minus five millimeters of mercury with a standard deviation of no more than eight. So if when you t take both of them together, there's a greater um, standard deviation than eight, then you really should not be using the auto um, blood pressure machine. The other thing is you need to check with your biomedical biomed department and find out how often they are um, calibrating the machine. Um, there should be a date on it that actually lets you know that so that you can really stay in tune with that. The other really important thing, and this is probably one of the most important, is getting the correct cuff size and placement. Um, this is again out of the toolkit where we have um, some guidelines as far as measurements for which size cuff is appropriate. The correct size cuff has to have a width bladder of 40% of the circumference and in a circle at least 80% of the arm. You always measure at the midpoint of the upper arm and you place the cuff directly on the skin with the bladder over the brachial artery. And the lower end of the cuff should be at least two to three centimeters above the anesthesia fossa. If you have a cuff that's kind of around it and you're having to put your stethoscope underneath the cuff to take the blood pressure, you're not going to get a very accurate um, measurement because a lot of times it causes turbulence and it causes you to miss the um, listening of the um, disappearance of sound. So make sure that it is at least two to three centimeters above the fossa. The other thing that's really important to think about is that there are a lot of consequences of this cuffing. Um, you can get an overestimation of blood pressure if the cuff is too small and it can be as much as call it um, 15 millimeters of mercury. If the cuff is too big, you can get an underestimation of blood pressure. If the cuff is not placed over the brachial artery, you get an overestimation of blood pressure, as well as if you apply the cuff over clothing, or if you don't put it tight enough, it's too loose. If the arm is positioned below the heart level and it's not supported, or if you're deflating the cuff too slow, you can all, those, all, those all cause overestimation of blood pressure. Um, so again, it's really, really important that we make sure that we're um, doing it accurately because undercuffing accounts for about 84% of all um, uh, inaccurate blood pressures, especially in our larger population with uh, large arms. And it doesn't just occur in overweight. Patients. It also occurs in very lean, small, statured women um, that if, even if you use a standard cuff, it may uh, overestimate blood or excuse me, underestimate blood pressure. So um, you need to make sure that you use a sitting or semi um position with the arm at heart level. It needs to be, again, supported. Don't just leave it dangling, but have it supported either under your arm or on the, uh, just bring the bedside table over. So 
The legs mm -hmm. need to be uncrossed and the feet should be flat, not dangling. The back also needs to be supported. Um, and you know that can also cause a, a inaccurate blood pressure if the patient has to support herself. The patient should sit quietly for five minutes before your blood pressure is taken. And sometimes we really, you know, we get them into bed and we slap the, the cuff on there and we take the blood pressure. So, you know, give them a few minutes to kind of calm down and kind of get them, you know, oriented a little bit. Then assess any recent, in the last 30 minutes, consumption of caffeine or nicotine. Or again, if they've rushed into the hospital, um, you know, coming from the parking lot and the traffic and all that, just give them a few minutes to kind of get their bearings. And then background noise and talking can all affect blood pressure accuracy. So again, make sure that the visitors are quiet and the patient's not talking um, and everybody is quiet. And these are some consequences too if you're not positioning right. If the back's unsupported, you, get a, you can have a diastolic blood pressure higher by up to six millimeters of mercury. If the legs are crossed, the cell can be higher than uh, by two to eight millimeters of mercury. If the arms are allowed to hang down and you're not supporting it, the blood pressure can be elevated by 10 to 12 millimeters of mercury. And if the patient's talking, blood pressure may increase by 8 to 15 millimeters of mercury. So, Again, these can be very significant when you're looking at patients that may or may not need treatment. So please, you know, make, keep these in mind that you need to be really as accurate as possible. Um, and this is again supporting the patient's arm at heart level, um, using the you know, first audible sound if you're listening by auscultation, um, for corticoff one as systolic, and for disappearance of sound, corticoff five as diastolic. Deflate the cuff slowly. Don't keep, you know open it up wide and, and listen, but go about two to three millimeters of mercury per heartbeat, and then read to the nearest two millimeters of mercury to get the most accurate blood pressure. We also recommend that you take it in the other arm and then use whichever one was highest. Then from that point on, use that arm um, to take more you know, consistently um, other blood pressures. Um, if it's greater than or equal to 140 over 90, repeat it within 15 minutes. And keep in mind that those auto blood pressure cuffs overestimate the salt by up to 46 millimeters of mercury and underestimate the by up to 10. And probably one of the most critical factors, and we've found by doing you know, surveys with various um, nurses and, and providers, is that many of them still, if you get an initial high blood pressure, will reposition them to their side, um, knowing that they'll get a lower blood pressure. Um, and as you saw from that case study, you know, it's really important that you don't keep her in the same position um, and keep her in a sitting or semi hours so that you really are comparing your trends in the same position. And again, it kind of goes back to if you're looking at a prenatal record throughout her prenatal period, in the office they're always in a, a sitting in an upright position for every blood pressure check. So we want to compare that trending to what we're seeing now. And the best way to do that is again, do it in a sitting position or at least a high balance position. Um, reporting the measurement is documenting not only her blood pressure and her position, but which arm it was taken in, whether it was the right or left, and what the cuff size is. And again, remember, sometimes if you have it, the automated blood pressure um, device set at uh, every 15 minutes or Q30 minutes um, blood pressure taking, you will get, the blood pressure will go off any time, and if you're not in the room, it won't care what position the mom is in, whether she's having contractions, whether she's had an epidural, if she's pushing, and as you can see from this mom, she's turned onto her side, and the blood pressure cuff is below, below the level of her heart, so you're not going to get an accurate blood pressure. So, you know, for this set of patients in a severe range blood pressure that you're concerned about that, Make sure that you are at the bedside when the blood pressures are taken um, so that you can make sure that she is in the right position, that the cuff is still on and, and in the right place, and that there's not a lot of activity going on in the room. This is really, really important. So key points are be consistent, use the same arm, same position, and the same cuff size. 
evaluate blood pressure trends versus isolated values. Um, and again, if you're using the automatic blood pressure monitor, don't put it in auto cycle. Be present, as I just mentioned. So the biggest challenge is what if her BMI is, is, a, is a high, you know, greater than 40, um, or sometimes even 35, depending on the shape of her arm. These patients are really a challenge in trying to find a cuff that will fit. So we, we not only worry about the size of her arm, but also um, the shape of her arm. As many, as many of you know, it's, it's conical shape sometimes. So even if you get a large cuff or the side cuff to put on there, there's gaps, um, even with the cuff pulled really tight, especially on the lower part of the arm. Um, and the length of the arm is also um, a, a critical factor. Um, so, uh, you know, and then cuff sizes and shapes. There are a variety of different cuff sizes, and you should have at least um, one of every shape or size uh, on the unit um, dedicated to these patients. There's some new data, and you can see these curved um, blood pressure cuffs, which are really good. Um, tools to use for the obese woman because they better fit her arm, upper arm, and you get a more accurate blood pressure. In fact, um, you know, when the arm circumference near the shoulder is much greater than the arm circumference near the elbow, you're obviously going to get a poor fit and an inaccurate blood pressure. Or if they have a really large arm circumference but a short humeral length, you'll get an inaccurate blood pressure because the, uh, if you use the use the side cuff. Um, the cuff will go beyond her elbow, and again, you're not going to be able to get into blood pressure. So, um, miscuffing in an obese patient is again using a cuff that's too small will overestimate blood pressure by up to 30 millimeters of mercury, whereas using a cuff that's too large can underestimate blood pressure by 10 to 30 millimeters of mercury. So, it can be significant. And for these patients, we really need to make sure that we have the right size cuff available um, to get as, as an accurate blood pressure as possible. There's been a, a lot of now articles out and research being done looking at um, rectangular cuffs versus the conical shaped ones for especially this uh, population of women. And all of the studies pretty much have shown that in obese people, um, the conical shaped cuffs are a much better accurate, um, much better for accurate blood pressure. Um, so, and I, I don't know too many hospitals that actually have the conical shaped cuffs available. So, it, it, again, they're, they're not too expensive. I would recommend getting some to have on these for these patients. Um, and this is the American Heart Association recommendation that if the upper arm circumference is more than 34 centimeters, Large adult uh, cuffs or side cuffs can be used. Um, for upper arm measurements greater than 50, they recommend using um, a cuff on the forearm and feeling for the appearance of the radial pulse of the wrist to basically estimate the solid blood pressure. So again, the accuracy is not going to be as reliable. The other thing that you need to be aware of is, uh, is um, any time that you you know, you take a blood pressure that's uh, further away from the ar arterial tree or more distal, um, you're going to get uh, due to resistance. Um, as the vessels narrow, you're going to get an increase in your systolic pressure and a decrease in the diastolic pressure. So it's not going to be as accurate as if you take it in the upper arm. So what can we do to improve blood pressure measurement accuracy? Well, again, one of the most important strategies that we found with our pre collaborative is to make sure that all the staff are properly trained on um, these issues. So, you know, you can incorporate accurate blood pressure measurement in the skills days. You can do bedside uh, skill checks with them. Um, have a facility-specific module. Um, we have some of our facilities put it into health stream and that each of their staff watch it. Um, you can just create a very brief um, you know, module that can at least get everybody on the same page. There's also a great video that's available through the New England Journal of Medicine, um, and I gave you the link here, 
to go on. And it's, it's a, I can't remember how long it is, maybe 10 minutes or so, that walks you through it. Um, it's a great video if you'd like to be a visual person. You can also do poster boards and have them available on the unit. And we also have some patient uh, hospitals that laminated the steps to obtain an accurate blood pressure and had them posted on the unit or in rooms so that staff could uh, be reminded of the uh, steps to take an accurate blood pressure. The other thing that we came up with is a blood pressure kit. And again, you know, most hospitals are saying, you know, it's really hard to find all the different types uh, sizes of cups because they you know, either didn't have enough or they go to search for them and they couldn't find them. So um, one of our hospitals cleverly put together a blood pressure kit that was like a just a plastic box that contained all of the different sizes of cups, a signal manometer, measuring tape to measure, um, stethoscope, laminated instructions in there, key actions, and they even included a reflex camera and a debris tool so that everything that you would need to really take care of these patients is in one place that they could just bring that box into the room and have everything right there. So that was another great way to kind of solve the issue of searching through the unit trying to find all this stuff. So as you get ready to implement you know, these, these tools and, and certainly uh, accurate blood pressure measurements, you need to make sure you know, create your burning platform. You know, make sure that you get people engaged um, in uh, convincing them that there really is a problem. That this is a, a, an issue that we saw, in, you know, in so many cases that we reviewed that people weren't accurately assessing the blood pressure. Um, and again, if you don't accurately assess it, you're not going to delay the diagnosis and delay treatment. Inventory your equipment. Make sure that it is regularly inspected. If you don't know how often that's happening, find out and make sure that it is um, calibrated and validated every six months. Ensure, again, that all staff are trained, and then update your protocol to reflect those current recommendations and guidelines. And so I'm going to turn it over at this point for Maury to go ahead and talk about uh, treatment recommendations. Thanks, Nancy. <clears throat> so once you've got the blood pressure uh, accurately measured, again, the trigger numbers are equal to greater than 160 systolic or 110 diastolic, repeat and treat within 60 minutes. But if you can do it faster, that's always better. ACOG standard is 60 minutes. I will point out that during the preeclampsia task force deliberations of California, we put in what's called alternative figures. There's some evidence that once you get above 155 systolic or 105 diastolic, the risk of stroke starts going up. ACOG uh, was very concerned about this, so officially it's the 160 or 110, but um, we felt strongly that this should be a clinical judgment that we allow practitioners to use. So, for example, some people will say if there's a rapid rise from what looks like a relatively normal blood pressure. Uh, and this patient seems to have a very rapid rise in her pressure going up to 155 or 105, that waiting for 160 or 110 may be a little bit more risky. Again, each institution should institute their own guidelines and then follow them. 160 over 110 is the standard, and you should stick by that. But if you want to move them down, there certainly is some evidence that that may be helpful. Next. And again, just to remind you that the first line treatment is either the betalol or hydralazine, uh, but that oral therapy is also now an alternative first line therapy for acute onset severe hypertension. And this includes the postpartum period, just to be sure. We're not, not talking about just antipartum, intrapartum, but also postpartum because that's a very dangerous time. We know that magnesium sulfate is the most uh, is the best medication for prevention of seizures through multiple, multiple trials. Um, and just to be sure that you understand that it is not a blood pressure medication. It is truly an anti-seizure medication. And even though there is blood pressure declines after uh, initial loading and then infusion, 
You should not consider magnesium to be an antihypertensive medication. It is not. It is not very good. And even though transient blood pressure may be seen, this um, this myth that they say, oh, we'll start on magnesium if the pressure goes down, you don't need to treat a hypertension, is not true. There's a lot of controversy about who to treat with uh, preeclampsia. There's no controversy about you start on the right-hand side of the table. If you have preeclampsia, which is seizures in a patient with preeclampsia, they all need to be treated with magnesium sulfate. And the five uh, organizations that we're referencing are ACOG, NICE is the United Kingdom, the British, SIGC is Canada, CMPC is California, and WHO is the World Health Organization. We all agree that eclampsia needs to be treated with magnesium sulfate um, because to prevent the next seizure, and that if the patient has severe preeclampsia based on the criteria we've spoken about, they need to be a magnesium to prevent the first seizure. The biggest controversy comes in the patients who do not have severe preeclampsia, have what we formerly called mild preeclampsia, or not without severe features. And ACOG has specifically stated in the blue for preeclampsia without severe features, it is suggested that magnesium sulfate not be administered universally to prevent the preeclampsia. And what they're basically looking at is what we call the number needed to treat on the bottom. The number needed to treat for severe preeclampsia, you need to treat 109 women to prevent one seizure. I'm sorry, for uh, severe preeclampsia, you need to treat 63 patients to prevent one seizure, which means you're subjecting 63 two patients to risk of mag, and they're not going to seize, but you don't know which one that is. For mild or non-severe preeclampsia, the number is almost double, it's 109. So you have to do the risk-benefit ratio, and that's a clinical judgment that you have to use, and, and your institution should come up with an approach. Some institutions are still using magnesium for non-severe preeclampsia, others are not, and are using clinical judgment. That is acceptable, but I think it has to be institution specific. Thanks. So again, um, there's no question that it should be used for severe preeclampsia, and you should consider it in patients without severe preeclampsia. One of the things that's been helpful, at least we're in our practice at Stanford, is we came, came together with our all of the stakeholders, including the anesthesiologists, the nurses, the pharmacists, we came up with all the preeclampsia box, where you have all the essential elements of the preeclampsia that you need for treating preeclampsia in one box. That means you don't have to go to the pixis and pull everything out separately. You can just run over with a preeclampsia box uh, to institute therapy, which is magnesium and antihypertensives. Uh, this is something that's been used a lot in the developing world. And I think, it, again, it's institution-specific, but it's certainly something that should be considered. Thanks. And just finally remember that it ain't over till it's over, and pregnancy is not over till six weeks postpartum. And the reason that I bring that up is that if you look at the bottom, it says number of weeks to the baby's birth and maternal deaths. You can see that although most of them occurred in the first four, within four days of delivery, there is a tail in the top line that of preeclampsia deaths. There is a tail that goes on and on for up to four weeks and up to six weeks. Now, a lot of the deaths uh, after the first week are due to um, sort of a, a, a multi-organ failure picture in the ICU, but certainly eclamptic seizures have been reported uh, up to two weeks out. Uh, we do say that even after one week the patient has an eclamptic seizure, they should certainly get some imaging just to be sure that we're not dealing with some other pathology and also to look for things like press, which is a posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, which is edema of the occipital lobe. Um, and there are a few other variants that may present. But just to emphasize again that the first week postpartum is a dangerous time, and there's still a tail that goes on up to six weeks out. Next. So here's a patient of a late postpartum eclamptic, which is greater than 48 hours after delivery. To four weeks postpartum is the definition. <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, this is uh, the definition of late postpartum preeclampsia, and many is 15% of cases. 
and a not, lot of patients have no previous diagnosis of hypertension. And just remember that it is not the magnitude of pressure does not always predict eclampsia. The most common presenting symptom was headache during about 70% of patients, but there were other evidence of end organ involvement, as you can see at the bottom there, that could have predicted it. So a postpartum patient complains of severe headache, new, particularly if it's new onset, should be taken very seriously, or if they have new onset of shortness of breath, very vision, noise of vomiting, edema, at least they should be evaluated. They may not have eclampsia, but they should be evaluated. Um, if you look at this data from a, one of the largest series, 20% uh, of patients did not have proteinuria with, pre, with eclampsia, and 23% did not even have hypertension. And a third occurred postpartum. So it's about a third, a third, and a third antipartum, intrapartum, postpartum. And the greater than 48 hours, about 16% occurred between 48 hours and four weeks. And again, more than half of these patients actually had normal blood pressures, but they all had symptoms of headache and visual disturbance. So we are recommending that if a patient has preeclampsia or eclampsia, particularly severe forms, if you use medication during labor, the patient needs to be evaluated at least by 72 hours. Uh, and that can be inpatient or outpatient. If you're still in the hospital, obviously you want to watch her. If you've discharged her, she should be coming back and getting a blood pressure check at 72 hours, and then again at seven days. And if they do not have medication usage, then at least within one week, they should have another blood pressure check. And anybody presenting anywhere, and they often present the emergency department with either hypertension, preclamps your cancer, should be assessed by the obstetrical service be amazed at how many times these patients are, uh, are admitted to an ICU with no um, obstetrical involvement in a patient who's just within six weeks postpartum. Next. You've already mentioned this. That's a second slide. And there's lots of patient education materials. This is one from the Pre-Cancer Foundation, which is a very nice pictogram for patients with limited reading skills. And now Nancy's going to finish the last five minutes on the results of the collaborative study summary uh, from January 2013. Thanks, Dr. Gibson. So I'm just going to share a few highlights from the collaborative summary. Um, and again, you know, some of the lessons that we learned. As many of you are getting ready to implement the preeclampsia um, uh, bundle, um, this should be very helpful. So these were our outcome, our, our measures that we did for the collaborative. Um, we had two outcome measures, one on severe morbidity and one on prolonged postpartum length of stay that was defined as greater than or equal to four days vaginal, for vaginal deliveries and more than six days for cesarean. We also had two process measures, and one was appropriate medical management, and that was the timely treatment of hypertension, and then debris done on all patients. And then we had a balance measure that monitored for diastolic blood pressure less than 80 on those moms who did receive antihypertensive. And within an hour, we looked at did they have any fetal heart rate category change? Um, and of those, were there any emergent deliveries that resulted um, after treatment? So I'll share a little of the data for that. So these were the areas that we uh, recommended in the collaborative to implement, and that was, again, we required all hospitals to educate all of their staff on that standardized blood pressure measurement that I just discussed. We also um, implemented rapid access to medications. IV treatment of blood pressure is greater than or equal to 160 diastolic or greater than 110 diastolic within an hour. And in fact, when we started the collaborative, we had a 30, within 30 minutes timeline that many hospitals were able to um, meet that guideline. Um, but we kind of left it at 30 to 60 minutes uh, throughout the collaborative. A uniform policy for med sulfate, early postpartum follow-up, and then a standardized postpartum patient education materials that not only included like the pictograph that you just saw, but also standardized written discharge instructions and follow-up material um, requiring them to actually set up a follow-up appointment before they leave the hospital. 
So this was for the severe mor uh, maternal morbidity measure. This is um, we defined uh, severe maternal morbidity as acute renal failure, pulmonary edema, ARDS, DSC, mechanical ventilation, postpartum hemorrhage, placental abruption, or transfusion. And this was some of the data that we saw pre and post toolkit <coughs> implementation. So as you can see, the gold um, bar is the pre-collaborative. And we had, at the start of the collaborative, we had all of our hospitals go back six months to collect their baseline data. Um, and then the orange is the 15-month post-implementation. And as you can see, if you look at severe maternal morbidity in general um, terms, we had a 34% reduction in our, um, from the pre-collaborative data to the post. However, we realized that if we include hemorrhage in that um, number, we had up to almost 18% of our patients had severe maternal morbidity. So we did a um, kind of a subcategory and looked at severe maternal morbidity without the hemorrhage um, listed in there. And you can see it dropped down to about 7-8%. Um, and we still saw a 48% reduction in morbidity after implementation of the toolkit, which is a, a, just a wonderful achievement. Medication timing, again, this is kind of a, an inter interesting slide, but you can see, you know, we kind of went go, go green as much as possible. The dark green is actually a treatment within 30 minutes. The light green is treatment within 60. So if you combine both of those, you'll see that many of our, 63% of our hospitals were able to get timely treatment within 30 minutes, and the rest um, achieved it within 60 minutes. So we had up to, uh, whatever, 85% were able to, towards the end of the collaborative, get their medication on board within 60 minutes. And this is just another graph to see, um, to look at it over uh, a bar graph. But again, very impressive numbers in a very, pretty much a short period of time. We also recognized early on that there were many reasons why those patients who met the criteria with severe range blood pressures that did not get medication. And one of the most important ones we found was that Many hospitals were telling us that by the time they took the second blood pressure, it was still elevated, went and got the medication, threw it up, went back to the room, and retook the blood pressure. It had now fallen below the threshold, so they withheld the medication. So that became a really important um, piece that we needed to um, you know, watch out for, so that there are times when it's appropriately um, necessary not to give the medication. There were all a lot of other reasons as well um, that we identified um, that hospitals were coming back. And one of them was that fear of hypertension, about giving patients um, antihypertensives, having their blood pressure bottom out, and having a fetal heart rate that deteriorates. And also just a lot of issues with trying to get the medication. Many of them at the start of the collaborative didn't have IV um, labetalol or hydralazine actually in their pixis or in their medication um, system, so they had to call the pharmacy and wait for it to come. So, you know, a lot of this ahead of time of getting these processes in place is really going to help you take the ball and run with it. This was our balancing measure, which was looking at, again, those patients with, that ended up getting me medication and then had a diastolic blood pressure drop below 80 within an hour of medication. And you can see that about 15 to 20 percent of treated moms did have diastolic that fell below 80, but that did not lead to um, any type of increased fetal issues. So that myth of people worrying that it was going to cause um, you know, fetal heart rate changes really didn't pan out with our with our collaborative, which was a really important thing to get back to hospitals to let them know that you know it really is. A, you know, most appropriate things to treat them and not to worry about that. Team debrief, um, we initially started with all patients that have severe hypertension should have a debrief done within you know, a few minutes after the event um, with all of the teams so that you can really identify what issues or processes that you need to fix um, in your hospital. Um, and you know, again, even though the numbers are a little over 30%, what we found, again, is many hospitals 
that had a high volume of these patients found it very difficult to do debris on every single patient. Um, but we still recommend at least doing maybe 10% of the patients because this is really where you learn where your issues are and you can fix these problems and really be able to achieve higher numbers. So we really recommend that you continue to do debris on as many patients as you can to get this information. So these are a summary of our process improvement. Um, we, you know, getting your hospital to come up with severe preeclampsia order set. We have samples of the toolkit, but we really recommend that you take them and customize them based on your own facility's individual needs. Um, we recommend, I think very importantly, having educational sessions, um, talking about accurate blood pressure measurement. Those are, that's a key factor in really early identification of the end diagnosis. Um, stocking pre-filled syringes of labellol was also a great way. So having to draw them up, they, all, they had them already made up by the pharmacy, so that really helped improve their ability to get them on board faster. We also found that improved communication and care transition between departments, and not just between LMD and postpartum, but also the ED and LMD. Um, and really, uh, you know, by getting everybody on board, having a, a collaborative model with inviting the emergency department into this whole implementation piece early on is really, really beneficial to um, improve the care um, through the care continuum. Um, removing the barriers for IV and hypertensive medication administration, as I mentioned, getting pharmacy involved so that the medications are available, um, getting your policies and procedures updated, um, all of those things are going to really help you uh, <coughs> and then continuation of med sulfate during the care inspection, not stopping it and starting it after delivery is an important piece. And then again, the debris became a part of the hospital culture. So we really made each side in uh, this collaborative over the 18 month period of time. And I think many of those hospitals are continuing to show improvement. As you get ready to implement these patient safety bundles on hypertension, you know, I, I, I hope that many of the things that we learn from our collaborative, which um, can really help benefit you in getting off to a good start. So getting the job done in your institution is, again, establishing tools, getting your uh, recommendations, getting your policies and procedures updated and ready to go. Make sure that you know who your champions uh, are and your collaborators within the hospital system. Um, and provide that convincing rationale for change. You know, it's really important that you get everybody on board, paint that picture, tell your story of why this is so important um, to improve the care of these women. Um, and then getting your providers to adopt the changes and providing that convincing evidence. Um, that all of these changes are well worth it in improving outcomes. So thank you very, very much, and we will, um, are ready to take questions. This is also, if you haven't gotten a toolkit, please just visit our website and download it for free. Um, and we are always here to help you if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy, and I just want to uh, express my appreciation for everything that's been done and recognize that this is a collaborative which means we're all in it together and we, we're not just physicians or nurses or midwives or family practitioners, we're all together in this to take good care of patients. Thank you. Thank you so much Dr. Drusen and Nancy, that was an excellent program. Um, I do have some questions for you. The first question is related to nifedipine um, regarding dosing and um, frequency that you administer the PO nifedipine. So the, the um, bulletin uh, says 10 milligrams PO and it should not be sublingual. The onset of action is fairly rapid. Um, I would have to look uh, to be honest, I don't recall the exact time of redosing, <coughs> but um, there is a redosing schedule. Remember that on, in the acute hypertensive bulletin, the one from February 2015, 
you've got three ways you can go. So if, if one doesn't work, you should be ready to move over. So for example, if I the labetalol doesn't work, you should be ready to move over to hydralazine or nifedipine. If nifedipine doesn't work, you should be ready to move on to another, another antihypertensive. I would, it's in the bulletin, the exact, uh, I think it's, I think you can give 10 milligrams again in, I think it's within an hour, but, I, but honestly I can't remember. Yes, as Dr. Dusen said, that is in the latest um, ACOG committee bulletin on um, treatment of hypertension. So if you have difficulty locating that, let us know. Okay, another question is, Let's see. Hold back. Is there a serum blood test that can replace the urine dipstick? Is there a serum blood test? No. So the urine, <coughs> the three ways of measuring proteinuria is 24-hour urine, gold standard, or a protein creatinine ratio of 0.3 or greater. Almost all hospitals can do the PC ratio. Um, it's, a, it's very simple to do, you just need to talk to your lab. If you have neither of those, you're left with the a dipstick, and that's it. The urine dipstick, there is no serum test that would help you determine potent area. Okay, the next question. Nancy talked a lot about how arm position and even such things as patient talking can dramatically alter the blood pressure reading. Many times women's blood pressure increases during labor due to pain, anxiety in first stage, and Valsalva in the second stage. Can the presenters comment on how they differentiate increases in blood pressure during labor as either from normal labor increases and actual preeclampsia? Well, again, I mean, that's one of the critical factors as far as if you're at the bedside, you take a blood pressure, again, in between contractions when uh, she's not in pain. Um, and yeah, it is a it is a clinical judgment situation. If you've got a patient who's in continual pain, um, and you know her epidural is not working, or maybe she doesn't have an epidural, that is going to affect you know your ability to really get an accurate blood pressure. But I think you know for the most part, if you've been taking blood pressures um, consistently in the same position, you'll be able to see those trends. And you know the, the bottom line is. is even if it is, uh, if any time it goes up in that severe range of blood pressure, she needs to be treated. Yeah, I, I can't, absolutely, I can't agree more with what Nancy said. So one of the problems I've seen, and, and uh, you know, I go around to a lot of these community hospitals and I, I do a lot of teaching. One of the problems I see is that there seems to be a tendency to want to deny the fact that the patient is actually having a problem. Because if you say she's having a problem, then you actually have to make the diagnosis, you actually have to treat her. It doesn't really matter what's causing her blood, blood pressure rises. If it's pain, you need to take care of the pain because those levels of blood pressure, 160 or 110, are unsustainable to a patient who is not used to that kind of pressure. So it is important to try and dissect out. So if the patient is in extreme pain, maybe you could just treat her pain and maybe her blood pressure will come down. And that's, as Nancy said, that really is a clinical judgment by the bedside provider. The bedside provider is the best person. If somebody is coming with a totally normal pressure and it's totally related to the pain, then we need to give her pain relief. But at some point you have to deal with the absolute blood pressure and pain does not cause a 160 systolic or 110 diastolic very often, I can tell you that. Uh, there's, there's this myth out there. It can happen in a very sort of sporadic way, but not in a sustained way. So I think it is a clinical judgment. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another question here. If the initial recognition of severe preeclampsia occurs in the prenatal office, do you recommend having the patient transported to the hospital via ambulance? Well, a, a lot of it depends on what's happening. So if you do a blood pressure and it's 160 over 110 or greater, uh, you, you uh, sit the patient down for 15 minutes in a quiet uh, room. Uh, you should be calling labor and delivery and saying, I may have somebody here for you. 
If she's then persistently at 160 over 110, you have an acute hypertensive emergency, and that patient needs to be transported in the most expeditious, medically sound way uh, to the hospital. Now, again, uh, it's all very much dependent on what's going on. If, she, if you're an hour away from the hospital, um, you would probably want to at least try and give the patient something to bring her pressure down while you're arranging for a transport. Uh, this is often difficult to do, but I think you do need to have a very high index of concern in these patients. Now, of course, if the pressure comes down and the second time around, then your choice is, well, what do I do next? And my recommendation would always be to get a set of labs just to be sure that that one spike of pressure just wasn't because she was upset and white coat hypertension, because that's what we tend to ascribe it to. But if you get into those ranges of pressure, remember the pressure itself is going to do the harm. It's not just a diagnostic, it's a, a treatment issue. So I would overreact a little bit, and I do, and uh, the nurses know that when I'm in clinic, they're going to get at least one or two patients, rule out three clamps here, uh, although I do have a high risk group of patients. But I think it would be better to overreact and evaluate the patient. And the simple blood tests that we're talking about are not very expensive. And a repeat blood pressure in four hours does not mean you have to admit the patient. I just, but I do think you need to have a high index of suspicion. Okay. Um, our next question is a very popular question. So, our hospital requires telemetry for patients that are receiving an IV push dose of levetalol. This seems to be a practice just because it has always been done that way. Are you aware of any research supporting this practice? And what is your practice when it, uh, when it comes to giving, to giving IV push levetalol? We have found that this is a barrier in our hospital. Now, I think this is a very common barrier, and um, it's based on a medical the sort of medicine recommendation for monitoring when you're given a patient a, a combined alpha beta blocker. Um, unfortunately, it's been very hard to change perception. Uh, there is no recommendation either in ACOG or the CMQCC for that kind of monitoring. It's considered a relatively safe drug to give. Obviously, the patient needs to be monitored. Um, you know, in a labor and delivery suite, you have to monitor the baby if she's not delivered. You have to make sure that you that the patient doesn't become severely hypotensive. But um, it is not the standard of care by ACOG, A1, CMQCC is not to have that monitoring. So it would require a change of hospital policy. But that's partly what drove us to go to the nifedipine route is because we were Encountering that, and in fact, I myself was at a community hospital one day in one of my satellite clinics when a patient was admitted, and I went down to to see her, and she had a terribly high blood pressure. And I, I, I naively said, "Well, how about let's do 20 milligrams of abetalol?" And this triggered the whole thing, and we couldn't do it. So uh, it, it is it is not an it is something that needs to be discussed. I think you've got the data. You go to your um, rivers putting that into the policy procedures and changing. And I just wanted to add, too, that was a major issue in the <coughs> initial part of our collaborative is that many um, hospitals were also had it in their policy that, you know, the patient had to be on a cardiac monitor to do this. And we actually, you know, we're looking at studies and all, we didn't find any studies that were done on uh, pregnant women. They were all um, kind of the uh, ICU uh, cardiovascular care unit um, where this policy was in place. And so it was really decided that, you know, for our population of women, that it really was not necessary to be on cardiac monitoring. And all of our hospitals were able to um, uh, change their policies after it went through their OB department without any problems. So um, I know that it is an issue, and unfortunately there's nothing kind of in, in a standard written format, um, but Again, we have not seen any problems with um, throughout our whole 18 months in the collaborative. Unless, right. as, I just want to clarify, unless their patient does have cardiovascular yeah. disease, yeah. then those patients should be. But if yeah. they're not, then there's, it's not necessary. Okay, great. One last question. 
How long should the patient be on IV mag sulfate after delivery? Well, um, the traditional has been 24 hours uh, because the, uh, the old data suggested that the risk of seizures drops dramatically after 24 hours. So I think that's a good basic guideline. A lot of people say, well, you can do it for 18 hours and they've got criteria like you are an output, this, that, and the other. There is no data, no evidence to support any of that. I think a reasonable approach is to go 24 hours uh, and then if the patient is totally stable and it looks like the disease is resolving, stop it. Now, if you're treating patients who do not have severe disease, of course, ACOG allows you to not give them MAG at all. So then you can you can adjust your thinking to saying, well, I didn't really need to give it to her, so maybe I can do it for 12, 18 hours. You can do whatever you want, and that's perfectly reasonable. I think the patient is very stable, the pressures came down, uh, she has no other symptoms, she's feeling fine, her urine output's fine. You can tailor it, it just is no data. Okay, thank you. I don't see any more questions in the chat box. So I just want to thank Dr. Drusen and Nancy Peterson for spending part of their afternoon with us. Um, we are so fortunate that they are able to share their expertise and wisdom um, to, on the behalf of all the moms in um, California and across the country. I just want to reiterate that if you are viewing with a group of nurses, please send me a list of the nurses, their license number and their state of licensure. Jay Vasher at cmqcc.org. Um, we had one last um, question come in. We'll take this question and then end. Okay, some providers at my hospital often do a 12-hour urine and then multiply it times two to get the 24-hour urine. Is that recommended? Well, uh, I've never heard of that. <laughs> I, 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 if there's data on that, that would be very interesting. Um, there is a 12-hour spot urine that the nephrologists have often used, but I don't know, I, I'm not a, because I've never used it, um, there must be some formula, I don't think it's as simple as just multiplying it by two, but it, it, I think there is a 12 hour spot urine that you can uh, use that will give you a relatively good equivalent of a 24 hour urine. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks again to Dr. Drusen and Nancy for leading this discussion today, and thank you to all our participants for joining. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us at CMCCC at Stanford, and we will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Uh, I think Julia.